Hi, everyone. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining us for turning a moment into a movement. I am your host, Jelly Love, and I also represent the Justice for Gerard movement. As you've seen in the video, Gerard um, recently passed away, but um, he's my son who was wrongfully convicted of a crime that he didn't do. And innocent, but he went to prison. And so because of that journey with Gerard and because of all the people that I met on that journey and all the experiences that I had on that journey, cre I created this platform called Turning a Moment into a Movement, where we come on every Friday at six to discuss wrongful convictions. Um, we talk about injustice. And our goal is, as a matter of fact, I'm just gonna put up the mission. Uh, to bring awareness to wrongful convictions, not only for about Gerard, but everyone else who has been wrongly convicted, over sentenced, mentally ill, and medically frail in our community, to inspire, organize, and educate all communities about the need to disrupt systems, policies, patterns of the of the criminal legal system that leads to wrongful convictions. That is why we're here. This is what we come to do every Friday. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, I am so excited um, today because we talked about him last week, Shamar Avery, um, and he's here this week to tell you his story in his own words. And um, I can't wait to get started. But before we get started, I'm going to bring on the panel. I see Trisha. Hello, Trisha. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Yes, it's 50 degrees and rainy, but hey. I know, right? But man, you know what? I'm just uh, trying to make every day a good day if I can. Some days is better than others, but today has been a good day. So I'm grateful for that and uh, looking for some better weather, you know? <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to spring and getting into that garden. <laughs> I know you are. That's your that's your home away from home. <laughs> yeah, that's my therapy. So, well, introduce yourself, Trisha. Even though you know, just in case this is someone's first time joining us, introduce yourself. Yeah. So, um, as you can see, I'm T Duck. No, my name is Trisha <laughs> Duckworth. I am the executive director and founder of Survivor Speak. I am the head consultant at Value Black Lives. Um, and most of all, I'm just a community member who is tired of injustice and willing to put my hand to the plow and do whatever it takes to fight against these systems of oppression. Um, as we always say, nobody's coming to save us. And so it's up to us to awaken, reawaken, and, and take our rightful places um, and fight against these injustices because I believe that we're seeing a shift. And if we continue to push back and do it the right way and do it together, yes. we will see change. And I hear people say, oh, I ain't gonna never see it in my lifetime. Well, speak for yourself. Cause this, <laughs> I do plan to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, right? And what mm. that means is I'm looking for justice right now. It's, it's non-negotiable, it's not an option and we're gonna keep pushing until we see it. Yes, I know that's right. Well, Trisha, why I have you on here? Let's talk about this weekend's events. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. So every third Saturday of the month, we come together in an intimate, um, vulnerable time together uh, for our wrongful conviction support group. Uh, we understand and we recognize that wrongful convictions affect those who are wrongly incarcerated, affect their children their families, their extended families, their friends, the entire community nucleus is affected by wrongful convictions. And so what we do is come together together every third Saturday so that we can share how we're feeling, so that we can know that we're not the only ones who feel this way, but also link up and network so that we can fight this fight together. So the support group is going to be this Saturday, tomorrow, tomorrow, um, Saturday, March 18th at 10 a.m. So please uh, use the link or 
the QR code to register. We will send you um, the Zoom link out. And we just want everyone to be a part. You know, we feel like we can be stronger together. Yes. And then also on Saturday. Yeah. So also, um, again, this is every third Saturday um, at 1 p.m., the Wrongful Conviction Task Force. We convened or I would say we established this uh, task force in 2019 after our first summit. And then, of course, we know COVID messed everything up. So we just want to come back together because we got to understand that we have to impact policies. We have to impact everything out here as it pertains to these injustices. And so this week, we're going to be talking to state rep, uh, Dr. Felicia Brabeck, who um, in our first meeting, I'll say, we talked to Commissioner Yusuf Rabi, uh, who it was a state rep. And as a state rep, he wrote a bill um, that would remove governmental immunity. So he talked to mm -hmm. us about that. He allowed us to understand that if we could find somebody to sponsor it, that it could be back on the floor again. Well, lo and behold, we didn't have to look far and we didn't have to find anybody. The wheels were all, already in motion. Uh, as I spoke with Dr. Brabeck, she allowed us to know that this bill is coming back up. And then, then she you know, said that she would come in, share this bill with us, get our feedback. Because again, we want to make sure that anything that is drafted for us does not happen without us and without our voices and our impact and influence. Also, we are going to have Congresswoman Debbie Dingell joining us as well. Um, again, we need in the Senate, we need in the House, we need where the state reps are, we need all of our legislators on board. And these two are definitely willing to come in, talk about what that looks like and um, get, get our feedback. So again, you must register. Uh, we don't share the Zoom link online because we all know Zoom gets hacked. Uh, but please join us tomorrow. Please register and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, so that your voice can be heard concerning the removal of governmental, uh, the, the removal of immunity from governmental officials. Yes. And that's important. We touched a, a little bit on that last week um, with the Oxford shooting and how um, with that court case just recently, the parents couldn't sue um, the school uh, officials or the school, I guess, itself because of governmental immunity. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, uh, it's time for it's for all of us. It's just not yeah. for some of us. Yeah. So, yes, I love it. So I see Attorney Mac. Hey. Hey, 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 we got you on mute. Attorney Matt, why we can't hear you? <laughs> we can't hear you at all, Attorney Matt. Try it again. You're muted now. Okay, there you are. Hello? Nope. Uh, Tony Matt, you might have to come out and go back, come back in. Try that. Okay. So we're going to take the Tony Mac off. All right, Trisha. So I just want everyone to know about our guest, Shamar um, Avery, actor, producer. Extraordinaire. Um, <laughs> yes, you guys, if you guys, his movies has been on Amazon um, Prime. I watched them and then when I, I never knew his story either until I really um I saw um and Trisha, I think we talked about it in a chat in the chat. I saw um someone sent me a link about the Wicca case and it was uh, regarding him. And so the more I dug into it and I was just really stunned, like <laughs> I, I have to talk to him. Like, we need to have this conversation. So he's here today, and I'm going to bring him on and let him introduce himself. But I just want you guys to know that on June of, um, 28th, 2000, he was wrongfully convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 20 to 50 years. So I see, before I bring him on, I see Attorney Mack is back. So let's see if... Um, he works. Let's see him. Tiny Mac. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand it. I, really, really. <laughs> Look here. If something goes wrong again and I disappear, I demand y'all call for a federal investigation. There's something wrong. Something, oh, really, something wrong. Hey, look here. I'm starting to get Sam Riddle syndrome. See, every time my black behind come on, all of a sudden the, the network go down. See, so, but, but anyway, look, 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 first of all, praise God and Jesus Christ for another day in the land of living to be able to stand up for what's right. Well, my name is Hugo Mack. And yes, I know what y'all expect me to say. It's coming. It's coming. So, so but what I want you to know is uh, criminal defense attorney, uh, former candidate for Washington County prosecuting attorney, proud to have been so because the people best suited to solve the problem are the ones who are living through the problem. Okay. Exactly. And, and, and you got to stand up. I, I don't care what happens to you. It's, it, it's not about you. It's about loving something greater than you. Okay. You know, to keep the word going, you know, to keep the word going. All of us only have a very finite amount of breaths left in our body. Mm -hmm. You know, and I heard Al Sharpton say, when his time come, he wanted to let the good Lord know, I didn't waste none of the breath you gave me. You know, I didn't waste it, you know. So in my own humble way, you know, I'm not wasting no breath in the time that that, that the Lord has, has given me. So I understand wrongful conviction, a victim of it myself. So... Um, I look at my sister Trisha and I look at J Love. You know, I'm so inspired, uh, Reverend Tia. So we're here and fighting in the venue in the garden where God has placed us. You know, so, mm -hmm. so pr proud to be here, J Love. I'm happy however, you're here too. However, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> if you find yourself on Trouble Boulevard, push, pull, tow, drag, cart that hoopity to Mac Street, Mac Street, park in my virtual underground garage. See, you got it, you got it, Trisha. that's right. And when you get there, call the Freedom Line, 734-239-3118. I love my backup singers. The Freedom <laughs> Line, 734-239-3118. And one more time, the Freedom Line, 734-239-3118. Whether it's the police, the police, the popo, whoever they are, Mac Street is the place you need to go. HMacLaw.com is your hookup. HMacLaw.com is your hookup. HMacLaw.com is your hookup. And yes, J Love, I do endorse this announcement. <laughs> in order to give people opportunity to write these particulars down, J Love and Trisha, excuse me for a few moments while I do the boogaloo. Okay, J-Love, that's enough time. So, J-Love, I want you to know I love you, I appreciate you, and I want you to know this endorsement is brought to you by Dr. Hugo J. Mack. If you yeah. don't want to win, don't come in. Uh. Dr. Hugo J. Mack, the one true king of Russia, Scotland, and Harlem. I love you. <laughs> Tardy Mack. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I see Reverend Tia. <laughs> if I ever need somebody to introduce me, I'm calling you. I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, I love it. If you don't want to win, don't come in. How <laughs> how can you? <laughs> Nobody wants to go after after the master. <laughs> I know I'm trying thank to keep you, thank you. Not gonna be last, Reverend <laughs> I know, right? That's why I like to be first, so that I can, you know, I can go ahead and be the background singer on that, you know. Right. But okay, here we are. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, Jay, I'm so glad to be here this evening, and um, our time is now. Yes. Whatever we are doing. I, I don't even say that we are in a fight anymore. Mm -hmm. I say that we are finished fighting, that we are allowing everything that is supposed to be ours to come back to us, mm -hmm. that it is ours. 
And, and when I say ours, I mean from the spirit of humanity that I believe right now that people are waking up to the inhumane acts that have been happening in our system for so long mm -hmm. and has been embedded in every way of education, the banking, housing, life. We're talking about life. And so, Jay, I'm, I'm just excited because we talk about wrongful convictions. These are things that impede the progress of not mm -hmm. only a people, not only a culture, not only families, but it is impeding the progress of our entire nation. Yeah. So this is Reverend Tia's little John Taylor coming to you from the choice zone. So because I want people to know that you have a choice, you have a choice about the way you think and the way you think is going to bring about the change that you want to see in your life first and in your family's lives. And then in those you touch, you are powerful. You are powerful. We are all powerful. And together, when we come together, change is inevitable. That's right. Thanks, Jay. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Everybody is here. Thank you, guys. So let's get back to Shemai Avery. He's here. I want to put us, um, I just want everyone to know who Shamari is. Again, he's an actor, awesome actor, producer. Um, he spent eight years in prison for a crime he didn't do. Um, eyewitness. We talked about that. Um, I want to say last, I think when we first started, when we started breaking down wrongful convictions, we started talking about one of the number one reasons why people are wrongly convicted was eyewitness misidentification. And so I'm so glad that um, he's here and we're gonna bring him on and we're gonna discuss Shamar's story. Hello, Shamar. Hey, how you doing? How are you? Welcome. Um, thanks for having me. <laughs> you welcome. So this is the whole crew. <laughs> we talked hey, about- <laughs> we talked about you last week, uh, a little bit about your story, and I had ran some of the YouTube clips. I don't know if you got an opportunity to see the last week's show, but just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what, you, what you're doing now, and then we'll go into um, the story. My name is Shamar Avery. Uh, I was wrongfully convicted in, uh, back in 2000 for a murder I didn't commit. Uh, I was released in uh, 2008. When I was released, uh, I, they, it really wasn't no wasn't no uh, contact with the system and how and us wrongful convictions at that time. So, well, at least that's what I I never got contacted when I got exonerated. So um, I didn't know I didn't know when I had got exonerated <clears throat> until I got contacted by the courts in 2017. In 2017, they contacted me about the Wicca which um they was uh telling me to prepare myself for uh a wicca trial which is the wrongful the wrongful compensation the wrongful compensation act for the for money right mm -hmm. wicca wrongful right imprisonment compensation act and they uh they which where they took me to court and fought me for my uh compensation which just happened last year um in Pretty much here we stand. Uh, since I've been home, I've been doing film production. Film production. Um, I act and uh, produce a uh, film, which what you guys was talking about. Uh, I'm on my tenth uh, project. Uh, we just released our web series, uh, McGraw Ave, and yes. we're in the process of releasing another web series and working on new projects. So McGraw Ave is you know you know really. Um has a lot of growing fan base um, as for people who didn't know that um, you guys can check it out. It's on Amazon. It's, it's also online. It's on, Tube, it's on Tubi, Amazon, uh, um, Vimeo. 
Okay, so so let's go into um, the story. You can just start wherever you feel comfortable with. Um, how does all happen? Um, and then we well, just talk. First about and foremost, I want to start off by telling you my heart goes out to you. And I'm um, sorry about what happened to Gerard. And uh, I mm -hmm. pray this happens to no one behind us as we can stop this as much as possible. Uh, yes. But we all know that we're dealing with a, a system that's pretty much have multiple flaws, not just uh, one. So it's many ways that, uh, like you guys were saying, people can end up in these situations. So, Yes, I know. I never knew. I used to see you with Larry, uh, Larry Smith. And I remember yeah. when um, Larry came home, maybe the month, Gerard came home in January. And I think Larry came home in February, but I um, we had him on the show a few times. And so sometimes I would see you with him and I didn't know you was wrongfully convicted. I, I really didn't even know who, I kept saying, I, he looks so familiar. I just didn't know who you were until- <laughs> I got, Everybody always tells me that. <laughs> I didn't know. And so- Well, you um, know what's, what's so crazy is, um. Honestly, until they reached out to me about my Wicca, I got so, um, I got discouraged, you know what I'm saying, about like, I never met other people that experienced what I went through. And just talking to, talking to a lot of people about me being wrongfully convicted and uh, still trying to uh, clear, which I, I clear my name. Other than that, I was like, I was just so terrified of ending up back in prison for something I didn't do. Or I, when they let me go, I just left it alone and tried to move forward with my life as best as I could mm -hmm. until they, like I said, until they reached out to me about the uh, Wicca and told me I had to come back to trial, go back to court and end up going through what felt like to me another uh, another trial. But that's where I ended up meeting um, the National Organization of Azanarees, which was Larry and uh, Ken at the moment and a couple other uh, Azanaree brothers. And, um, and, I, and I started finding and meeting a world of, of people that this is going on to happening to that's when i met um valerie newman and uh and and everyone from uh the ciu unit and uh and that's where we are today with, with just helping the movement of just trying to help and make sure that i can do whatever i can to stop this from happening to anybody and trying to get what happened to me out and about so it won't happen to nobody else and they can fix this situation what's going on with the wicked here in our state yeah yeah, it's sad that you had to be retrial. It's like going through the trauma all over again. So yeah. you were, how old were you in this? Um, I was 17. 17. Okay. Yeah. So you can, can you give us a little bit of a background of the story? If you feel comfortable. Uh, sure. sure. Um, I ain't do it. That's as much of the story. I don't, I, I, because I don't know. I don't know the background of the story. I got wrongfully convicted for. Uh, uh, it was a crime of a, a murder where a piece of guy had ended up getting killed in Southwest Detroit, and um, and they randomly was just going around picking up everybody in our neighborhood. And when they had picked me up, I explained to them that I didn't know what what was going on or whatever. And the officers, uh, which his name was Ira Todd, he uh. He beat me up in the interrogation room, hit me with the phone, slapped me, plucked a piece of hair on my head, told me um, he was going to put that in in a little bag and say that, that that's what uh, he got that from the guy car that got killed. He was pretty much trying to make, make me sign a statement saying I did what I didn't do. And I, that's what got, that's how I ended up going to prison. And, uh, and there was three of us, it's actually three, three of us that was on this case. I retired. That name sound familiar. Attorney Matt. Well, the name doesn't sound familiar to me, but the profile sounds very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And really, um, first of all, brother, I'm 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 very sorry, man, that, that 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 happened to you, man. But the only thing we can do is, like you say, move forward and let our sacrifice and our suffering be to the benefit of somebody else in the future, you know? Yeah. And, yes, uh, sir. You know, so, I mean, it's see, and you know what, you know what, let me just say this. I don't mean a sidetrack here, but people do not realize what it is 
to be accused, convicted, and punished for something you don't do. They, they, they don't. I mean, they don't. I mean, God bless people that have big hearts, that are empathetic and sympathetic and fight for justice. And that's wonderful. We need that. We wouldn't be, we, 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 would, we would not be where we are without them. But when you do that to somebody, you're not just taking their liberty from them. You're, you're attacking their soul. You're attacking that person's soul. And look, I can relate to what this brother's saying quite, quite well, you know, and have people, oh, you know, you did it. You know, you did it. You wouldn't have been in there if you didn't do it. You know, police wouldn't be spending all that time judging that jury and all the people who spending that money. You know, you did it. And, you know, and unfortunately, we have that in our own community, J. Love. Yes, mm -hmm. we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. In our own community. So anyway, so oh, the, no, that's one of the. Excuse me. That's one of the first things. Like, so, like even up like right, right now. If you, if I was playing to somebody, I was wrongfully convicted. That's one of the asinine questions that they ask. So, what did you do? If I explain to you, I was just wrongfully convicted. Like they, and they say stuff like, "Hey, what, what made the police come get you, or what made them pick you up, or you know, they, like, you, you, you know." And 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 Jay Love, what what your brother says is quite true because the bottom line is. Black people, we got a hell of a mojo been run on us, boy. We are the greatest Americans in the history I mean, of right. And and I think that um like for the most part with this, we being used by a system that we got so much trust in. We trust like definitely as kids, we are taught to trust into the ju the, the judicial system mm -hmm. so much that it's gonna do right by us, gonna protect us, and um and, and then when something like this happened, it's just so unbelievable that is it is it's just unbelievable. It, it is. And see, and see what the brother says is so right, Jay Love and Tia. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to get along with it here. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting this off. But the, no. the police culture knows that. See, they mm -hmm. know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they know that when they come in front of a jury, most people, whether they admit it or not, and I've cross-examined tens of thousands of jurors, they will not be honest and say, I wouldn't be up in here with my time if something didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna be fair and impartial. I'm gonna say that, but deep inside, you know, you did something, and I I fought, battle that all the time. So when police know that, they don't have a reason to be honest. You know, mm -hmm. the one the few police who want to say I'm gonna do an honest job regardless, those people are castigated. J Love, they mm -hmm. are castigated. Okay, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We just got a lot of people that work under the color, what work under the color of law, and they use it to their advantage. To us, that like I said, we we're blind to the system. We we trust the system. Like I never would have thought that if I even did get picked up and got put in that room, that something like that would happen to me. I never would think an officer would sit there and ask me, "Yo, did you do something?" And I say, "No," and he start trying to make me say, "Yeah, I did." So like I I, I would have like. You never see nothing like this coming. So that's why I say we just got to educate. And at the moment, we got to know when our rights being broken. Yes. We got to know how to act for our freedom. We got to know because once they got you in that room and you locked away, I don't care what you say. It's like being on It's like being on that boat and in that movie, I'm a star. It's like you speak in a language they don't understand. You can yell, I didn't do this all you want. They looking at you stupid. They like they 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 don't under, like to them. Everybody back there with cuffs on on that side of that room, they they guilty. They nobody's trying to hear that once you get accused of anything. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's it. You know what? This is uh, this is so dear to my heart, and um, I just I th I'm grateful that that you are out. That you're not still there. I know that many people are still behind bars who are not supposed to be there. And I think that I want to impress upon our viewers and listeners that we can no longer sit back and say it's just the flu, that this doesn't happen to a lot of people. You know, what we are witnessing right now is a reality that we have been living with and that we have said Oh, well, it doesn't happen to too many people. This reality has devastated our entire community time and time again. Mm -hmm. And we don't see it. Right. So the importance of talking, 
because it's, it's so important because silence right now is not an option. It's not an option. And we have to know that the badge does not equal righteousness. It doesn't mean that because you have a badge, that doesn't mean that you are making right decisions and that you are having right action and that you have the right kind of mind. Exactly. You know, so we need to stop that. That is a lie. And stop calling the police on your relatives, people. People who may be suffering with mental illness or something else. What we need to understand is that these police seek out people who don't have enough economic base to sue their behinds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what, Shamar, tell me the name of that officer again. His name is Detective Ira Todd. Detective who? Ira Todd. I, I put it in the chat, Reverend T. Put it in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, and, what um, happened to him? Um, last that I um uh, read read up on, our retired was investigated for uh for other other situations like mine that he was under review for, and uh he he was in he was getting in trouble for stuff like that, and, um and I just want to make aware that like learn like I said while meeting other exonerees and meeting other wrongful convictions like free Kensu, free Tamia, um, Rice, free uh. Everyone like there's so many names that I don't know yeah. who to name and where to start and stop. But meeting brothers like Bernard Howard and Larry, um, Larry Smith, who, where it was, it's, it's being proven in situations where the they use CIs that consistently are are setting people up for wrongful convictions. This stuff is happening to where the system is is set, is is doing this to us, and like you said, not by accident. So our families and us just got to know our rights and know that when when you got someone that you love in those situations, check on them, stay in touch with them. You know what I'm saying? Like just because they are in jail, don't mean that they're being treated right. You know, the, the, them people don't do they they jobs properly. Like I said, they and a lot of this stuff don't happen by accident. A lot of these wrongful convictions, a lot of us is not accidents. Right. Now it's a hot mess. All it's of it is a mess. hot mess. It's, it's, it's totally mess wrong. Out. Yeah. Right. So uh, I know we had um, attorney David Robinson on here and um, he wrote a book. I see you see a hero. I see a human. And it basically it was about um, Detroit police during the time where uh, attorney Matt, if I'm getting this right, during the time where they were um, just so <laughs> corrupt and they had to go under, um, is that a consent agreement or a consent? Okay, so, and a federal uh, oversight for right. what, about 13 years or something. And they were out here just doing all kinds of ridiculousness. And you, as you see, these exonerations are coming back doing, from that period, you know. And I retired. I think he did a lot of stuff, but then they paraded him around like he was a hero. He was on um, different um, consultants for different TV shows and all that stuff. But he ended way, up. Listen, the way he did me, like. He got he came and got me out that cell late one night, put his arm around me, guided me up there to that floor to the fifth floor. Man, he had, he made it seem like he like was gonna help me in my situation. He got me in that room, handcuffed me to that chair and started slapping the shit out of me, started trying to make me sign the piece of paper, making me he pushed the recorder and made me try to say I refused to say I shot somebody, but he kept trying to make me say I shot the dude and he kept trying to say you did it on accident. Stop lying to me. I know you didn't do the do it. Like, man, that, that man is, is that that man something wrong with that man. And I never forget that man in my life. Never. It, and we we wanna we wanna fight him right now. I know that I am a minister, but right now I wanna find him. Yeah. And I don't see why yeah. it has wow. taken so long for people to receive justice when that man has acted inhumanely. And what is surprising is that people aren't running around with signs in front of his house, calling him the monster of monsters. 
And no, you cannot tell me that he's not a monster. And no, you cannot tell me that he's not insane. Mm -hmm. And See, yet, he's in a powerful position. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Aunt Trisha. I see you to pop back in. I'm here, y'all. I had a bad hair day, so I wasn't going to come on, but I wanted to. I wanted to. Um, you look beautiful, girl. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Um, I just wanted you to see my face, bro. Um, I love you. I am so disturbed completely about what has happened to you. And I thank you for your strength because in spite of it all, oh, I watch you. I mean, I was watching you before I knew about this. And I was like, man, that brother doing the doggone thing, you know. So, but to know all that you went through and to watch you thrive and to just take your kingship and just, just mm -hmm. know who you are, you know, mm -hmm. I salute you. I am grateful to even be in this Thank space. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I feel blessed to even be in your presence. And yeah, I'm mad as hell. And yeah, yeah. I'm a little cussing preacher. So y'all sanctified folk that mad about other folks that cuss you, close your ears. But this right here, this right here, and what makes me mad is that we just, some of us, we sit and we allow and because it hasn't happened to us, we don't do right. nothing. We don't say nothing. We don't, we don't, I don't understand how we, we can't feel compelled when we hear these stories and these atrocities to get into action. And I, I think I know why, because when trouble hasn't like this, hasn't knocked on your door, like attorney Hugo Max said earlier, you, you wouldn't even have a clue. Yeah, we're fighting alongside you, but, but we don't even have a clue. So people that aren't in the light of this or the knowledge of this, like, like Brother Dion says, some of us don't have love for humanity. And until we all can be mad as hell, as like it did happen to us, until we get that mad about it, Mm -hmm. is never going to change. Never. We've got to get as upset as if it happened to our baby. I mean, I'm looking, I'm just thinking about my brothers. You know what I'm saying? Well, you are my brother, but I'm just saying like my brothers that came from my mom, I can't even imagine them going through something like this. So because I can't imagine them going through something like this, I'm going to fight so nobody's brother has to go through this. So nobody's father has to go through this. So nobody's grandfather has to go through this. We got to keep pushing until we see change. Exactly, Trisha. I know. That's battle the DPD and every other police department that keeps coming with all these atrocities over and over again, all of the misconduct, all of the Brady violations. We got a whole Brady list. Why they ain't fired? Why they not in court? Why are they not being prosecuted for this why mm -hmm. isn't every case that they tried or every case that they had were a part of why aren't those cases being looked into because mm -hmm. if they did one wrongful conviction doggone it they have done more mm -hmm. i know when i was on sam show we were talking about the brady list and how all these officers have been on the brady list for years with no accountability so that's when we talk about the government well, immunity. Well, Go um, ahead, Shema. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, well, that's another thing why maybe I need to explain to the audience. Um, it's also the way I am exonerated, but there's different ways that we can be exonerated and released. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, due to the way I'm exonerated, I'm exonerated, but they say my innocence is not proven all the way so that's what they just made me try to go to trial for and that's what they are writing within that wicker bill where they say we have to prove our innocence um clear and convincing to the point where okay even though we're exonerated they they still went back and they used that uh right they went they and they still used the evidence that i was exonerated of they used it against me still I, so um i'm kind of confused on honestly how to uh, how to legally explain it because it doesn't make sense to me um 
So if somebody in there and they can explain it, I because I, I even just went to trial and I'm I just even went to my appeal court. I, I had to go all the way to Lansing and um I sat in the courtroom and I listened to them still talk about this situation as if um I still have any any guilt of it. And uh and they're still using this evidence that this lady saying this lady lying that's all they still using this lying evidence that i was exonerated of against me so i don't know what i really don't know like i don't know what the wicked is built of i don't know because we're exonerated so i thought my innocence is proven but apparently it's not and i'm in the process of still learning how to still prove my innocence yeah because you know what it doesn't make sense you're trying to make something make sense just because it's legal does not mean that it makes sense. Just because it's written does not mean it was logically written. It doesn't mean that it was written to protect people or to serve justice. It was written to keep a certain person down. Mm -hmm. That's it. It and makes I no sense. It right. doesn't make sense. And they, they want to keep money in their pockets. Then I'm right. going to show up. But yeah. That's I was going to say that too, Reveteer. They don't want to pay. Well, they don't know how this is psychologically. So I, if anybody that can re tell, like, psychologically, what they send us through is, is man, it's, uh, can you tell women I'm on the Zoom call. I'll call right back. Um, psychologically, what they send us through is, like, again, I can't explain it because I felt like I just was, was retried for I never even I never even reached out to the system about a lawsuit or nothing because I never knew about compensation. I was just happy to get my freedom back. So since they contacted me in 2017 and they've been trying to retry me, I'm still lost on what are they trying to do to me? And it, and daily it still drives me crazy because I don't understand why they still trying to prove me guilty of something that I didn't have nothing to do. And that's what I keep asking them. Like so, I don't never care. I really don't care about the money, honestly. Uh, I, I pray. Myself. I pray right now, right now, that your entire life will be blessed beyond measure, so that you can look them in the face and tell them to keep their fifty thousand dollars. Tell them to keep it, or how much ever it is. I believe that you will make twice more than they could ever give you, and that the abundance that you're going to have in your life is going to outshine and you will be the first person to tell them where to take their money mm -hmm. and no longer will you be held captive and i'm talking about anybody else who is held captive out there because of money serving that not serving the money itself because money is nothing by itself it's the mm -hmm. energy you put into it so if you want to be a slave to the dollar and a and a high class prostitute in the system, then that's up to you. That's for everybody else. Mm -hmm. But I, I tell you, it's time out, and I guess you all can tell by now that I'm a little tired of it. Mm -hmm. And and I know that, Shamar, I know you are. I can't imagine going through what you attorney mac baraka so many of our brothers and, and this is in close proximity mm -hmm. that have been wrongfully convicted mm -hmm. and the mental anguish and the life and the years that you can't even know how to get back mm -hmm. Because you can't get it back. What you got to do is start from now and start from today, every day. Right. But it see, some people can look back and look back at good memories. But when you look back and you have to see trauma, that's a different kind of view. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you. Uh, real quick, I ain't telling them to leave the money behind. I'm telling them, get your money. What she, what, she, what she said it, when she said it, I was thinking with the prayer, I looked up, I'm not gonna say that to their face. No, I'm not gonna just say that. Yeah, you know why? We're gonna figure something else out, but I would not say that to their face. 
you know, you know what? Don't take it if you if you have to if you have to take it. And they say that if you're found with anything later, or if oh, you get yeah. picked up uh, later, and that you will automatically go back to prison. Don't take it. Yeah, don't set yourself no. up. I don't believe that. But don't set what I mean up. is, and I, you know, I had my hands up, so I totally understand and believe what you're saying. But what I'm talking about is this: they owe that. They owe that. That's only a portion of it. Come on, that's reparations. Mm -hmm. that's reparations. And that ain't that small amount of year. Who are you to say that a person only going to make $50,000 a year? This is a bona fide a filmmaker extraordinaire. We don't know how much <laughs> yes. he, he would have made in those years. $50,000 is pennies. Right, Please, compared to what they go, so you know what I'm gonna say? No, get the bread, but you know what? We need to get up off our asses and talk to our legislators because that's legislation. Yes, that is the wrongful imprisonment compensation act. So, you know what that means? Those folks that you vote for over and over again, if they don't get this together, if we hold our vote, I bet they will. If they start to fear us. Because they know we coming when it's election time and then we're going to hold them accountable when it's not election time. Things will start to change. This is legislation. This is why mm -hmm. everybody listening right now, I hope that you are at the, the wrongful conviction task force meeting on tomorrow. Because this is why we're going to meet every third Saturday. Because we need policy change and we need it now. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Because um, the way we doing it right now is the cycle is continuing. You know, eight, uh, Shamar came home in 2010. But we still have 2008. But we still have people in 2023. Still, the cycle is continuing. There's no accountability. And so that's why we have to have legislation. And, we have to so have many people. It's happening to more so every day as we talk. Exactly. And guess what? Some people will never be exonerated. That's true. That's there, true. Shamar, you're like the the person, you're you're like the small number of people that's gonna be exonerated. That's the right. people, there's gonna be so many wrongfully convicted people. Mm -hmm. That's going to be I was, never exonerated. I was, I was, I was number three hundred and some thousand in prison, but I'm only number seventeen thirty eight exoneree. Wow! 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 And and you see, and the system is not that good. Okay. Mm -hmm. The the system is not that good, and so. We make a mockery, when I say we, the people of the state of Michigan, we make a mockery when we have enshrined in our state constitution, the Court of Appeals, that you have an automatic right to go to, you have automatic right to. But when you have people running for the Court of Appeals, when you have people running for circuit court judges, that's where these felonies are coming from, circuit court, all right, who run as if they're running for sheriff or running for prosecutor, that's where the problem starts right there. Mm -hmm. You see, it starts right there, and I encounter that every single day. It starts right there. It's almost like, and, and frankly, frankly, uh, one of my platforms when I ran for county prosecutor in 2020 was to break up that incestuous relationship between the prosecutor and the police. And I, incest is a strong word. I know what it means. You know what it means. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's mm -hmm. exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? So what I'm saying is, is that... It's not just these police. If you had a prosecutor that was willing to put his or her foot in somebody's behind, yes. I am telling you right now, a lot of that SH would stop. I'm telling you right now. But the problem is those police have unions. Those police have all kind of backers. And nobody wants to go on the record as being, quote, unquote, uh, anti-police. A couple months ago, Jay Love and everybody else, we had a situation with a Michigan Supreme Court justice. Remember mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Because remember, it gets so short. It gets so short where that man wanted to let it be known, look, I'm pro-police now. You know, you know, I'm I'm, I'm pro-police. And the way I'm addressed that pro-police is, what is wrong with you hiring somebody to shot the police? 
you ain't doing that in my court. Okay. Right. So, and, and I'm saying that, that he may have tried to rehabilitate himself from that. And hopefully he's learned from that. But if it happens in the highest court in the state, what do you think is going to happen in Wayne County with the Detroit right. Police Department, the Inkster Police Department, the Grand Rapids Police Department? Ten times worse. And that brother there is living proof of it. Exactly. And when you, yeah. you and when you say attorney Matt, uh, when people when people show you who they are, believe them, what you're That's saying, right. he showed us. I mean, he could be very apologetic, but he showed us who he is. And we and and you're right about our short term memory. We forget, and then we out hanging out with them, and in the pictures with them, and just you know, like nothing has happened. But you still have your loved ones sitting in these prisons, wrongfully convicted, over sentenced, <laughs> sick people. Michigan has the largest number of elderly people inside a uh, prison. I read that and I was just like, I can believe it because Michigan also has the most uh, highest over sentencing out of all, you know, all the states. Michigan is number one for that. So, yeah, Michigan is number one in inhumane acts. I mean, I would like for us to be number one in other things, but when you think of we're one of the prime areas for trafficking, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. We have the highest number of mentally ill incarcerated, mm -hmm. along with the elderly incarcerated, the highest number of youth behind bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What message are we sending to our communities? And then you wonder why children are afraid of police. Then it's right. then it's so much investing on like you were just saying, it's so much investment on everybody going into this system. Like it's not a lot of investing on people coming out or or rehabilitation or anything like that. By by me experiencing what I experienced and even even coming home. Like when I came home, first and foremost, there was not there was like I reached out to man, I called everybody but nine one one for help. Like I was trying to find <laughs> Like, <laughs> in that series, I didn't know which way to go. Cause you know, when you first come home on parole, it's an address for you to go report. And then they give you stuff like they help you with your ID. They help you in classes. When I came home, like there was no programs for me. I wasn't on no type of parole or nothing. So I was just pushed out of prison and sit and hey, go. I didn't even, I was, there was no, there was no agent for me to meet up with. There was no directions for me to meet this person, go sign up to this program so I can get and in, get into this like skill making set or nothing. I, there was nothing for me. So um they just let you out like it, nothing happened. Okay, you could go home. Literally, I, I was called to the control center and the ADW warden let me know that she had never been put in this position before. And I was sent home. I called my family to come pick me up. Um when and when I was released, I was given a court date. And from that court date, I was told that they didn't have, a, I wasn't going to be retried. And I never heard from the prison cell. I never heard from the courts again. And last time I heard from them was in 2017, saying that I, that I was, there was an interest for a Wicca. Wow. You know, what's, what's amazing is that, so a death did occur. I, I want us to see this, this whole thing. Mm -hmm. A death occurred. Someone was murdered. They wrongfully convict somebody. Then they come back years later and say, we made a mistake. Then they, they let you out. The murder still happened. No. Um, Are they going to look for the person? The biggest no. part. Never hope, okay, okay. You said because you said the biggest part that makes the biggest difference. They never say we made, they never said that we made a mistake. They just said we no. don't have enough evidence to hold you is what they said. We don't have enough evidence to hold you, so we have to release you. It's not no, we made a mistake. So at that point, like even to this day, they're not saying that we have somebody to replace you. That's the biggest part. They don't have nobody to replace me from that bed space. So they're making me suffer because they don't have a conviction to replace my conviction. And you know what's asinine about that is the fact that they didn't have enough not only to hold you, 
they didn't have enough for your first conviction. You should have never been convicted. If they don't have enough information <laughs> right. to hold you, why would they have enough information to convict you? That is like you, asinine. Like you said, they're covering up. They're covering up their weak cases with uh, for the for the at this point for the compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, everyone everyone's case is different because everyone end up in there on a wrongful conviction differently. None of us know where we getting. None of us is, was expecting to get picked up where we get picked up from. I got picked up from school on my way to school. Others get picked up from church. Some people get picked up from home. Like, and um, and, and so you gotta imagine just leaving your house to go, like for my instance, on the way to school, and police pick you up and find out you're being looked for for something you didn't. So when they pick you up and you just being accused of something, it's like it's like you just walk into a, a movie that you don't have no knowledge of and you so from that point again it's like um and i believe at that point how and so i i try my best so i can see a, a clear vision i try not to point blame at everyone so i i've sat in the situation long enough to not blame the prosecutor for the da uh, job not to blame the da for the officer job even though they all are supposed to have something that connects their job to make sure I like before he turned in this i can uh, i can see if that's right because once an officer turned their reporting in to i think the prosecutor office or the da office they trust that the officer did their job so when the prosecutors are doing their job they're hoping that the people prior before them so i try not to have just a complete anger at everybody for one department mistake or one, so like again everybody's situation is different so when they release me and they say we didn't do nothing wrong, I understand because they don't know what that officer did. And I never legally knew how to put that in. And I never knew how to file the 1983. I never knew of me filing anything saying my civil rights was broken. I've never, so, so until this day, that's why I say, I think it's most important that we learn our rights because at certain moments, like even to this moment that I'm sitting here, I, I the system don't know because I never filed in 1983. So as they read my case, I can easily explain this to you guys, but I never had a chance to explain this to nobody else. They shut you up once you get once you get in court. You're not allowed to to tell this story that I'm telling. I never got a chance to say this to nobody, but people that it couldn't help me. Attorney Matt, um, uh, Shamar mentioned something. Which uh, 1983? Mm -hmm. What's uh, that? Civil rights violation under color of law. So, I mean, for example, so if you've got a sheriff, let's say, that is going around, let's say, arresting black people, all right, un under color of law, where there is no lawful basis uh, and abuse of process, abuse of authority, that is a 1983 action. Originally designed to protect black people from the Klan, by the way. Um, mm. So, so what what happens though, the problem is, and once again, once again, we do need local action. There's no question about that. But we need some federal action also because the threshold is so high, is so high with qualified immunity to, because uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, now, now, now you can be qualified immunity. Now, I, I, I want everybody to understand that. I want everybody to understand that. But the threshold is. To me, so high. What does that mean? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. What does that mean? Qualified what, immunity. What, what does that mean? Well, what, what that says is, is that if you're acting in a governmental authority, let's say uh, a police officer. OK. And you're acting within the scope of your authority. Let's say somebody is speeding. OK. And you pull them over and there is some kind of a tussle. Let's say there's a there, there's a tussle. Let's say somebody says there's excessive force and the police say, well, no, it wasn't excessive <laughs> force. It was it was just a force that was necessary to okay. somebody. Even if you're claiming excessive force, qualified immunity nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten will prevent you from successfully holding that officer accountable. OK, OK. So but 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 but, but as I said, there is a way around qualified immunity, but it is. It is so high. It's like a reckless endangerment uh, something. In other words, right. the police were so, it's almost like 
almost like you got to show the police just came in shooting, just just shoot, just shoot. You know what I mean? And unless you got something that is that high, it's it's next to impossible to overcome qualified immunity. That's why J Love, when you talk about that Oxford situation, mm-hmm. I'm sorry about them kids. I, my heart breaks for them kids. And but I will say this: out of every tragedy, God says good can come. And I'm 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 sorry. I just got to say it. I got to say it. We will only get traction on this when some of our white brothers and sisters start seeing the pain of this themselves. I'm 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 just going to date myself for a little bit. There used to be an entertainer named Art Linkletter. Okay, the Art Linkletter show. Okay, you know, uh, a white guy, multi-millionaire. Okay, conservative, lock them people up. If they don't want to be in America, get the hell out. Okay, with the drugs. Yeah, well, the potheads and, and the hippies and the freaks. He didn't have that way until, until his daughter got high on LSD and jumped out a hotel room and killed herself. Now that's a tragedy. But after that happened, Art Linkletter turned 180 degrees around because it hit where he lived. You understand? It hit where he lived. He became a major proponent for, we got to do something about these drugs. <laughs> you know, you know all this LSD. We got to do something about that. But he would never have done that if mm-hmm. his daughter had not gotten high on LSD and jumped out that hotel window and killed herself. Don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Google it. Google it. Don't take my word for it. You see, so with that Oxford situation, Jay Love, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that is the crack in the wall we've been needing. Yes. <laughs> yes. I when I heard the podcast and they were talking about it, um, the the lawyer, what's his name, Vin Johnson, when they they did a whole podcast on the government and immunity, and I'm like, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. they're gonna bridge, make that go over because mm-hmm. as long as we have been battling with the wrongful convictions and the over sentencing and the civil rights abuses, we haven't been able to get anything. <laughs> done right. in that area arena but now yeah. that it's happening to someone else and they're seeing that hey nobody's being held accountable you know yeah. my kids this kid all these people knew that this kid had some kind of issue but everybody pushed it under the rug or pushed it to the next person and now yeah, he sure. came here and shot up everybody and nobody wants to be held accountable same yeah. thing with us you know, they knew back in the, what is that, the late 90s, 80s, 90s, that whole period where they was just really ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You look at how the, everybody yeah. is coming home. That's the 90s. One, Go ahead, Shamar. One thing I can, one thing I can definitely say, um, I hate that we are in the space we're in because seeing so many of us uh go through such a tragedy and um like and, and like but and like you just said, some don't get exonerated. Um, because right now we are in conversation and we are in relations with with a lot like uh Tamara Rice, um, Andrew Blunt, um Kensu, uh we got a lot of people that's not free yet that has that they're still behind bars fighting for their freedom. Then we got a lot of a, a lot of us that's that that then came home then we got some like your son who who tragic situation that he lost his life due to him not being able to even though he made it home he still couldn't get over what he experienced but like i was telling you um but like i was telling you miss love um things got that mysterious ways of working sweetheart because now we talking in numbers when i was mm-hmm. like i told you when it first happened to me i'm the only person that i ever knew that i was running around telling people that i was in here for something i didn't do like and, and I, I didn't know nobody else saying that. I didn't know nobody else fight. Like I met people that was teaching me and helping me, like with my case and with law. But uh now to see what we're talking in numbers and we are being effective. We are going to these legislative meetings. All of us are meeting up like next month. We got an exoneration meeting out in Phoenix, Arizona, and we're all gonna meet up. We all got plans on still doing uh stuff to change laws across the country. On yes. just different on multiple levels on how to not only make this not happen no more but to make sure that due to the prayers of people that it happened to that we help them get out and that we help those that that's out get their life back in order because we still go through so much once we are out this like this is like like they don't know like i don't know if anybody ever spent the night in jail or in prison but yo imagine spending some years in there it's not easy 
So um, I, I so to 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 make it through that that war and make it back home is like being a vet. Mm-hmm. So people are still messed up in the head. A lot of people go through a lot of things with touring in prison. So I mean, um, I know Shemai, when we was I talking, just, you were saying about the no therapy. You know, nobody even offer you any kind of therapy. You know, they didn't offer you anything. And I know, even when Gerard came home, I was saying, you know, he was telling me about the noise, which is so noisy. And, you know, I was like, we need to probably, you know, get you some therapy. But, you know, people are, I, I don't blame him. He was so happy to be home and out of that space, you know, for something he didn't do. You're not even thinking about that. you just trying to go get out of that place. Go ahead, uh, Rabbitia. Yeah, you know, it's that fight. Um. Mm-hmm. The realities of being locked up that people just, it just goes right over their heads. And I, mm-hmm. I think it's not having the ability to um, empathize with each other and to understand what a person, even if you didn't go through it, to just take a moment and imagine it. Right. I mean, um, Shamar, your story, right. your life. That that that's an actually life that's that's real. Um, it really um, hits home because I, I think about you leaving school and getting picked up. Is that what happened? Well, I stopped by my grandmother's house. Me and my cousin stopped by my grandmother's house on the way to the school, and she had let me know that the. Uh that the, the police in our neighborhood had wanted to talk to me and I went to talk to them on my way to school and I, I never was released from there. That's where they, that's I when I went imagine. to go talk to them. I didn't know what they wanted to talk to me about. So when I went up there to talk to them and they kept me, that was, that's how they, that's how I ended up to the police. And so, and this, this is a hard thing to say to our youth today, but you are not allowed to talk to the police. I mean, if you have to really instruct young people, you cannot, not only talk, don't talk to strangers. See, at one point we were teaching that the police, these are the people in our our neighborhood, in the neighborhood. It was on Sesame Street, I think. The the people that you meet each day. Mm -hmm. And they would say all these different people that are in our neighborhood who are part of our community. And here we are trying to, now we have to tell our children. But not only that, you have to say it for just about everybody. You cannot speak to a stranger, whether it's a police officer. You can't have a conversation. You need to see me. You need to come get to home your adult your parents yeah you need to tell them you have to speak to my parents right and even for our dogs you can't go yeah. anywhere alone you're gonna have to get to your lawyer you can't go lawyer. anywhere and think that you're having their job is to investigate they're not your friend exactly they're not your exactly friend. i don't care yeah, how I'm- great they are when it's come to investigation it's against you. You mm-hmm. have to cannot walk in there. You cannot take let your kids go in there. Without, I, I have heard so many cases of, you know, kids going in there, yeah, by, themselves. Going in there by themselves. And, yeah. then, you know, these kind of things happen. So you can't. And, and just like Shamar said, he thought he thought the police, the officer was going to help him out. Mm-hmm. And then he chained him up and slapped him around. My heart, I can't imagine. I got two sons and a daughter. We not slapping nobody up in here, not in this camp. And and I, I don't know how your caregivers, you were with, were you, you lived with your parent, your mom? Yes, I, I was living with my grandmother. 
when you were living with your grandmother. Yes, I'm a grandma too. I don't know <laughs> what I would have done. She's quite a woman. I can't know, and I would love to be able to stand and say I would have done the right thing. But I'm be honest and open and say that I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have that as a test. Because what you're not going to do is slap my child back and forth and not have repercussions. That's what we're not doing. Well, the sad part is once and once you're in that interrogation room, how do we create a situation where we can protect our own people inside that interrogation room? Because them officers got right. They they do what they like. They once we once they take us up there in that room, man. Like, how do we? How, how? they're not supposed to interrogate you without your parents or guardian? That was that was wrong from the beginning. Yeah, that's why they ended up in under federal oversight, Reverend Tia, because they was doing so many injustices. They were committing so many injustices. That's why Michigan have so many juvenile lifers. Because right. of the and, way and they still they got was, pensions and jobs and everything. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. Go ahead, um, Trisha. You see, when I want to say something, I come on with my look. <laughs> Um, I just want us to re really understand that all of this is connected. Mm -hmm. As nobody gets a pass here, not the prosecutor, not the judge. Now, as a matter of fact, I worked on a case where the judge, what do they call it, the preliminary hearing? The judge said, well, I believe all the witnesses are lying, but I'm still going to let this go forward to trial. What you mean? What you mean you believe they lying? And then what kills me is that they will use that lie to convict somebody, but they won't use the truth to set them free mm -hmm. by the same person that lied. So none of them get a pass. And even the prosecutors, they know. You know why? It, look, they it starts with a wrongful arrest, okay? Yeah. Then it comes with a wrongful charge. You know who charged? Mm -hmm. Prosecutor. So they got to take that weak evidence and try to build a case on it, right? And and I've even, now, I don't know, what, I'm an ID watcher and a first 48 watcher and SUV, even though I know that. <laughs> even though I know that, you know. No, no Trisha. But what I mean, <laughs> no, Trisha. A prosecutor will, a, a, a police will come to a prosecutor and a prosecutor will be like, that ain't enough. You got to go get some more. Okay, that ain't enough. And so then they apply all this <laughs> to this person and they go round up all this false evidence and then a the prosecutor will stamp it knowing doggone well that from the start, none of it was true. So they mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. participate. I think somebody in the chat said they're all in the bed with one another. And guess what? We vote half these jokers in. Yeah. I keep going back to that because that's mm -hmm. our voice. And our vote and holding these jokers accountable is all we got. Prosecutor gets voted in. The people that hire the police, your mayor and your city council, your mayor and your city council is the ones that are responsible for those jokers. They're the yes. ones that give the money to them. Yes. When we talk about applying pressure, there are ways to hold these folks accountable. But you know what's missing? Us. Mm -hmm. We missing. We've got to awaken ourselves. A lot of people, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, they said, my vote don't matter. They don't care no way. Well, your one little vote don't matter. But where two or three, I dare you to link up with some folks mm -hmm. and start to vote based on our needs. And wrongful conviction is a bipartisan effort. This ain't, this ain't, wrong, this ain't Democrat. It ain't Republican. It's righteousness. Mm -hmm. right? And so everybody needs to get on board for that. That's how we hold them accountable. We got to hold the ones that are in office accountable because we hold them accountable. I bet you we say, if they think they see is going to be threatened, you don't think we're going to see some changes with the police. And then we've got to start to show up at these meetings. Your, mm -hmm. your, your, your police department has police commissioner meetings. 
we need to be going to these police commissioner meetings together, united, and saying, what the hell are you talking about? What's mm -hmm. going on up in here? Because we got case after case. There was a man, I don't know his name, I forgot his name, 85 infractions he had exactly. with the police department. How do you have 85 infractions and you ain't locked up, first of all? Okay? And he's still getting promoted. He was, he was still being promoted. Chu, I think his name's. He was still being promoted and had all these infractions. And you're right, it's co police commission and also the county commission. They hold the purse strings. They hold the purse strings for the entire county. Because guess what? Ain't no your, your prosecutor's office gets funded by the commissioners. Your, your Wayne County Jail, funded by the commissioners. Wayne Sheriff's Office, Wayne County Sheriff's Office, they get funded by the commissioners. We go to these commissioner down here in Washtenaw County, I done slid in so many Washington, so many commissioner meetings and seeing them funding and giving the sheriff's office so much money is sickening. So much money to turn around and violate us. But guess what? Those are voted in. They voted in as well, yes. So oh, we yeah. can hold them accountable, but we got to stand together collectively and do it. Yes. Attorney Matt. Well, one thing I wanted to say, you know, uh, for years, our juvenile public defender, okay? And time after time after time after time, one of the most duplicitous forces in charges against these young kids, over more than black, I might add, was mama and daddy. You say, what you talking about, Attorney Mac? You crazy. Mama and daddy love that, that, that boy. They ain't going to do nothing. Love carries a demonstration. And what I'm saying is, is that the problem with us that we as a people have had, trying to be the greatest Americans in the history of America, that respect and love for law and order, you almost think that black people think we're living in Leave it to Beaver. You know, you've never seen one black person leave it to Beaver. <laughs> you ain't never seen one black person dead the menace. You never see a janitor on Dennis the menace. I, look, I grew up watching Andy and Mayberry and uh, uh, Mayberry RFD. I ain't seen one black person in that hole, and, and, and that's in North Carolina. That's a Southern state. But anyway, 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 anyway. So, so what I'm saying is part of the problem that I had representing juveniles is mama and daddy coming in. Boy, you better tell the police. You better tell them, you know, no, nah, we don't need no lawyer here. Uh, Travis, uh, uh, Kiavion. Go on and tell them now. Yeah, tell them. You heard what I said. Well, mom and daddy, you know what? Little Travis Kiavion may not be as Snow White as you think they are. And what I'm saying is when you tell your kids without you talking to them first, without mm -hmm. them having a lawyer to advise them first, to go on and talk, you are helping to put that noose around their little neck. That's exactly what you Because by the time I get the case, they don't talk to the police, y'all. They don't. They don't sign the statement. They got recordings and all that, you know. And then when I asked mom and daddy, why, why did you do that? Cause we raise our kids to to tell the truth. I say, you know what? You know, save that for Sunday school. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When you're dealing with the legal system, <laughs> it's adversarial. It's not. It's not. It's not coming together. It ain't no kumbaya. This ain't no damn healing court. You know, one of the judges downtown and our circuit court judges, they got like the healing circle. <laughs> the healing circle. I, I'm, I'm not criticizing. Where, where they pass the peace beads around, you know, and everything, everything is good. It's not that way for young black kids. We don't have a healing circle. You know, you know, we got a hanging chair. But we ain't got no healing circle. So I guess what I'm saying is to the black parents and mama and daddy, Medea, big mom and all that, love your kids, but tell them to keep their mouth shut. There is a time and place for talking and there's a time and place to keep your mouth shut. Okay. So, um, and again, I think that comes with educating us on, on, on our rights, sorry. educating us on, on, on on what on what our rights are because again we're we're being misled and mm -hmm. and, and i don't think it's none of our fault we come from generational after generational of people that trust a system 
Like it ain't even like I couldn't even be mad at my I couldn't be too mad at my family that when I got kidnapped because they trust the system. My I have a praying grandmother that trusts the system. Mm -hmm. I have a mother that trusts the system. Uh, so so they they didn't know what they were lost. So I like they didn't know what to do neither. They they just they just knew that the court that the system had had me had me for something that I did, and they were hoping that eventually that the mistake that were made will be fixed and I'll be free. They were praying as I was praying. No one legally knew the next proper step to take to get me back. Right. That's why we're here. That's why we're here every Friday. Cause that's our goal to educate. You know, um, we can't, Trisha say I watch those TV, uh, <laughs> CSI and stuff. We can't take what we see on TV and apply it to our daily lives. Cause that is that's where we go wrong and guess what they count on that they count on that and then when you get in court because they said this at Jiraj trial forget everything you watch on tv because that's not what's going to happen here and so they the, the prosecutor that's who said it so we had to educate this you know we had to learn and we had to educate each other we had to educate our, our loved ones, our kids, unfortunately, very young. Because they're young as 15, 16, 12, going in these um in these institutions. And so yeah. go ahead, Trisha. In my defense, I <laughs> I know that those stories aren't real, right? No, but, but I'm just, I, I was being funny. Trisha. No, 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 no. But, but what you're saying, I just want to further expound on that because a lot of us, that's all we'll do is watch stuff like that thinking, you know, I, I research outside of that. But some yeah. folks, that's all they're going to do is watch that. Yeah. And that becomes a part of their reality, which is a false reality. And then when we get in these, in these situations, I, I, I it happens without fail watching first 48 they'll be like they'll sit down in there and what's the main thing that attorney hugo max said don't do close your mouth they be well i just man like you said we got to <laughs> educate ourselves and we got to educate you know our kids you know this brother was 17 years old mm -hmm. and i can I, and in real talk i can honestly like through experience and I just telling us don't talk, don't say nothing ain't enough. That ain't enough. But that gets you railroad sometime too. So yeah, you, you yeah. just gotta know your rights. Yeah. And so it ain't always just don't talk, don't say nothing. Cause again, that ain't I don't know about all situations, but sometimes that is that that like just know your rights. Know your that, rights. That, that, we need like prepaid legal for for Thank you. <laughs> We really, need. I I remember I had prepaid legal and it worked. I don't know about you know. I paid that twenty five dollars a month or whatever it was, and when I needed a lawyer, I was able to call somebody and have a conversation. I had a little card. I know they don't have that, but we need some kind of system where you have someone to call because I agree, Shem uh, Shamar. It's not enough to say we well, don't talk, and you got somebody beating the hell out of you. Right. You know, right. it's in your mind you don't want to talk, but in that moment when it's just you and that person, you 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 fighting for your life. Yeah, different yeah. story. Um, different story in that interrogation room. Right. You got a so lot of do. And I, you got a, you got a lot of the, the prison system full of a lot of killers that told on themselves in that room. Yeah, and so we do need some kind of um, legal recourse where we can invest in, but also we need to be to more unified when somebody's telling you that they didn't do it have a conversation listen to them i know when i was telling people my son didn't do it they were saying well how do you know you don't know you know like you don't know your people i know he didn't do it he has no reason to lie to me you know I know his who he is as a person and i also know how his health you know, he's not out here, you know, doing these kind of things. But we are so 
easily manipulated and believe the police before we even believe each other. And these is your relatives, your friends, the people, people that you're talking to every day. Right. That's doubting the stories and know the history. That's the other part. We know the history of these things that happen, but yet and still, people are quick to say, "Well, how you know? Well, maybe you did something." You know, you know, doubt doubting you. So now you're fighting by literally almost by yourself for your freedom. We have, yeah, to I, that. yeah, we need to get together. You know, I see um, Charity was saying how we need to join together. Yeah, we do need to join together. But first, we need to have to understand this is not nothing new. This mm -hmm. has been happening forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the reason why prisons was built, they was kidnapping people off the street. Hey, soon as slavery was over, they was putting them in the prison because they still needed people to pick cotton. We had to keep it 100. This is the reason why these things are happening. And when somebody telling you, hey, I didn't do this, I'm being wrongfully convicted, we have to be, be more compassionate and have an ear to listen and support each other and stand with each other and help each other. You're right. If we're, if we're all together telling these stories and not just one person here, one, if we all stand together, we'll have more power to stop this stuff. But if we're one here, one there, they're going to keep on fighting you. Like you said, they just sent you a letter out of the blue because they probably didn't want you to come back, start asking for your money, or they're trying to cover up something, or they're trying to do something that's not beneficial to you, but they just want to get it on the record because right, right. Ran out of money. You know, they had so many wrongful convictions. So, yeah. And you know what, Jay? I wanted to just say, that is so important what you were saying what you were talking about because people will join a narrative and just state it over and over again and freely just speak that out well you don't know if he did how do you know if he didn't do it but it's so surprising when you walk with people every day and i realized um joining jay when it came to gerard and um i knew her heart i didn't know gerard well but I had seen him. And so I said, I said, you know, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm with you all the way. I don't know what, what happened, but I'm with you. Let's, let's do it. You know, but just if you say, yes, I don't know exactly what it has happened. You don't have to know. All you have to do is know that the person needs your help. Exactly. And that's all you got to do is, walk with them and help yes. if that's what you want to do if that's what you feel called to do but what we need to stop doing and i'm gonna I'm say this because there are some people because i'm just going to be real genuine right now i think it's because i didn't have a lot of sleep and it's okay what i'm going to say is that for some people who get in my face when i am talking about wrongful convictions and i begin to talk to you and you come with these stupid ridiculous pulled out of your behind narratives i'm looking at you and i have already decided that i have now entered into the ignorance zone mm -hmm. so you need to figure it out get some education about what's really happening thanks jay you're welcome <laughs> and stop trying to you know you want to interrogate the person you want to interrogate the victim instead of looking at the system. You know, the system is corrupt. It's been corrupt. It, it wasn't built for us. It needs, we, everybody want to reform it. Actually, it needs to be dismantled. <laughs> it's not working. It has not worked. <laughs> and, and, and we're not saying that every single person is wrongfully convicted, but we're saying one is one too many. And that and, and that we need to stand up, and that we should be tired. Go it's, ahead, um, it's, it, and it, it's it, it's learning the social economic breakdown of like what the system means, and and when you get into like the the economic system, at the, the economic issue of the system really being built basis on a business and not 
all our per like we take it personal because we deal with it personally but the mm -hmm. system is based on a business this is this is a big exactly. it's a business so so when you when you we looking at these cases are like cases but when you look at these charges these are charges that the state get by number they get money for these cases per per per, per um conviction and um so it's just learning is and I, I i like to study uh, like michelle uh, michelle alexander um mm -hmm. the, uh, the the new jim crow um uh, uh you um professor uh um the um i'm sorry my brain just had a quick little um brain freeze real quick but alexander yeah yep, um yep uh, uh projects like that where it just breaks down the social economic parts of the prison system and you can just overly understand why you know what i'm saying certain certain like why it's being built and why it's being ran the way it is so careless because mm -hmm. of so much money flowing through that month excuse my french that motherfucker the way it is and um and it's controlled by money not emotion so uh right corporations mm -hmm. make tons of money free labor right today people working for 32 that's free you know and the contrast, to keep, and, the co and the contrast to keep them prisons just full like at yes. that point the contract that our state take on to keep the prisons full uh which which trickles down to to the the to the laws and and how simple it is for certain cases in certain states just just to take cases and and how easy it is for them not to fight and just you know what i'm saying and, and so and once we all understand all them conversations all them topics under one umbrella we can we can probably know how to fight to get what we want a little different yes and look at the long the younger you are the longer your sentence then that guarantees them labor mm. think about it you're 17 years old they you said 20 20 years or something 20 Not, years yeah, of free and and when you get into them, uh, when you get into that topic, you will learn more about uh, at least with our state at that time. We start building independent contracts with California prisons like Wacken Hut, which I was sent to the juvenile prison facility um, um, in Baldwin when they first opened up the juvenile facility, where we was, where they were filling that prison system with all of us juveniles, um, and, and it was just ridiculous. So a lot of the cases was so weak, and just we, it's a lot of them cases being overturned now. You got a lot of us juvenile lifers that built them facilities up that's being overturned. Revetia, go ahead about whacking hut. Girl, you already know. You already know when it talks is talking about whacking hut, wacky hut. Mm -hmm. I can't even believe when you look economically, you guys got to see the the change. If you just go on Google, everybody Google everything else. Google whacking hut. Google who the ownership see all the different changes that have happened through the years where it started from what it is now and even though it's crazy Wagon Hut had many violations yes sexual sexual all kinds of abuses physical abuse neglect on the children who were in Wacken Hut Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were they, they, they was torturing. They was torturing. Wacken Hut is out of money. They they have transferred that thing over. Follow the money. Yes, I mean they had kids. Uh, they had kids in there, literally trying to kill themselves. Yes, and some succeeding. And some succeeding. They had a high rate of suicide. That's why that was one of the reasons why they had to shut it down. Yeah. So you just said what I just typed in the chat says follow the money. That mm -hmm. judge in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. He sent many, many, many children to prison or to a juvenile. It might have been a juvenile uh delinquent, so they call a place. Um, but I believe it was prison. He sent many children there. But guess what? The place was giving them kickbacks. This mm -hmm. a judge. You think if one judge did it, it ain't more than one judge doing that. Mm -hmm. We got to follow the money. Look how many of these lawyers and judges and prosecutors and, well, I won't say prosecutors, but you never know how many people are benefiting from the prison system. How many people are benefiting from the 13th amendment so we want to hear go here go another login i'm talking about voting again i'm sorry i'm just on the voting kick tonight but the 13th amendment is a 
it, it's an amendment, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so that means that it can be further amended. That yes. means that it can be abolished. Who is that on? That's on us to lean on these jokers that are in office to say, we need to get rid of that. Ain't no more slavery, period. 13th Amendment done. Now, in my opinion, the whole constitution needs to be scrapped. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. I'm sounding like my brother now. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because, <laughs> okay. The 13th Amendment, they told us, they said, this don't apply to you because you're three-fifths less than a person. Mm -hmm. They ratified that in 1863. Now, I don't care whether they ratified it on the books or not, because in their mind, they still believe that we're three-fifths less than a person. Now, they might not tell us, but that's what they believe about us. But again, all of these things are laws. These are laws. Who votes in laws? Our legislators and sometimes us. Well, guess what? We don't need to wait on them to vote for something. If we want to, we can put something on the ballot ourselves. All we got to do is get uh, petitions and get signatures and we get enough signatures. We can abolish the 13th Amendment ourselves. We don't. Nobody's coming to save us. Mm -hmm. Nobody's coming to save us. We've got to take this thing by the by the. You know what I'm getting ready to say, but we need to take this thing and really do something with it. And guess what? We can. The power lies with us. Now, I ask us all, what will we do with it? Will we lay down these egos? Because we spend so much time fighting against each other. The oppressor just sitting back laughing at us, mm -hmm. laughing at us. Because all we want to do is tear one another down because we don't understand by any means necessary. And I know I'm going off track a little bit. I'm going to come right back. By any means necessary means any doggone thing that we can think of to tear down this demon of injustice, doggone it, we better be doing it. Whether it's voting, whether it's protesting, whether it's leaning on legislators, whether it's going to city council meetings, no matter what it is, we got to be pulling out all the stops. But the yes. buck lies with us. Exactly. Because no one is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. Well, you guys, Shamar, um, thank you for joining you to us. Come back for part three. Right. <laughs> yes, I know he's busy. You, I know your schedule is so full, but whenever you're available, you're, available. you're always welcome to always join us. You. you got a new fan base. Got a, you got a, you got a new fan base. Like if they didn't know you, they know you now. <laughs> they got a, they got, they got a clearer vision. I appreciate this panel so much. Y'all got a new fan base, and uh, thank y'all. I appreciate y'all for everything y'all do. Yes, thank hey, you, hey, 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 Shamar. Yes, you got sir. you got my yes, contact sir. information. I do now. Hey, look, uh, give, me, give me a call sometime. There's some there's some questions I want to ask about the procedure they're using in that in that wicked thing with you. OK. Uh, yes, sir. Because but but it's going to be an in-depth conversation. I don't want to take all, all, all the all the time here. But was it uh, j j just quickly? Was it an ineffective assistance of counsel argument you made that that the court reversed on? Yes, sir. I got, uh, yes, sir. I got a, a reversal on my Ginther hearing. Okay. And my Ginther was, right. was lack, lack, lack of evidence under uh, ineffective system of trial counsel. Okay. 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 You got, you got, you got my hookup down there, man. Uh, uh, give me a call yes, sometime you get a chance. I want to talk to y'all fair about it. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. It has his number on I, there. I, I, I got it. I, Okay. And if cool. I don't, I, if I don't get it now, I will text you, uh, Miss Love, and okay. I'll definitely get it from you. Okay. All right. HSmackLaw.com is your hookup. HSmackLaw.com is your hookup. HSmackLaw.com is your hookup, baby. <laughs> <laughs> look here, look here, hey, look here. We we didn't start a whole new thing today. From now on, J Love, Trisha. Reverend Tia, and when she make a cameo, Alexandria, these are the Mac X. That's what they are. These are the Mac X. Mac X. <laughs> That's what's up. Yes. Um, so anytime you know you want to join us, feel free. You always have a seat with us. 
I um, appreciate y'all and thank you. This this is very fun. helpful, so I do appreciate it. So before we leave, we have a few things we want to say again, Trisha. Tomorrow is the um, Saturday, the task yes. force. Please join us tomorrow. Uh, we need your voice. We need everybody at the table. We're talking about removing the immunity. And for those that don't know what that means, these jokers can do what they want. And sometimes we can't touch them because of these qual qualified and absolute immunity. So we ask that everybody join us at the 1 p.m. meeting is via Zoom. If you register, I'll send you the Zoom link. But we need all hands on deck um, as we listen to uh, Dr. Felicia Brabeck talk to us about this legislation that could possibly be enacted soon. And we want to make sure that our voice and our impact and our influence is, is shaping this bill that can possibly uh, be voted in as law. So please, everybody, meet us at 1 p.m. And then lastly, if you um, if you uh, so desire, we ask that you meet us that morning at 10 a.m. for the Wrongful Conviction Support Group. We all need to know that we're there for one another. We're taking a space where we're vulnerable. We're sharing. But most of all, we're connecting because we're a people that's rising and we understand that we're more powerful together. Yes. And also, also, we are supporting the Final Push Project, Clemency for Susan Brown. Um, she's an awesome person. To find out more about Susan's story, this is the link. Or you can check out her um, QR code. She has a Facebook page if you um, to connect with. And also, uh, donate to the Voice of Detroit. You're not at the gym. Um, it's um, an awesome news letter, digital newsletter. Um, Miss Diane has been writing these wrongful conviction stories and crossing the T's and the dots for over 20 years. So um, she needs our help to continue to, um, for her to do this work. So to um, donate, go to www.voiceofdetroit.net and also save the date. The Love Gathering is coming to um, June the 24th, 2023, a day of love, fun, food, self-care, and a celebration of life. It's inspired by the memory of Gerard. And so I'm inviting you all to join us. I mean, this work is so heavy. And sometimes we have to take a break and to be, you know, the fellowship with each other. So um, put this on your calendar. More information is coming soon about the Love Gathering. So join us. Trisha, you have something to say? Yeah, I, I see in the chat here, and I've, I have never heard this name before, and I just think we need to just um, put this name out here in the atmosphere. So many people to free. I see Tamira Davis, Demille Duke, Susan Brown, Andrew Blunt, Tamira Washington, Arians, if I pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry, Jackson, Andre Nelson, Carlos King, Martez Clemens, Robert Greathouse, and this name that I have not seen before, but I am going to definitely be looking more into this story and linking up with you, uh, Chantel, free Marvin Haynes. Yes, and Chantel, send us an email. Um, I'm going to put it up in the two seconds, so stay on. So, um, yes. Um, and that's it, you guys. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back next Friday. Um, any, any, anything else, you guys, before we leave? Attorney Matt, no. Reverend Tia? Perfect. This is perfect. All right. Well, on that note, we'll see you guys next week on Turning a Moment into a Movement. Thank you. We love you. Thank you.